സോ ഗുഡ് മോർണിംഗ് എവറിബോഡി എന്നെ രണ്ടാമത്തെ ലെക്ചറാണ് ഇത് ഒരു പിന്നെ എസ്റ്റഡേ വി ഹാഡ് എ ഡിസ്കഷൻ അബൌട്ട് ദ കോൺസെപ്ച്വൽ ആൻഡ് തിയറട്ടിക്കൽ ഫ്രെയിം വർക്ക് ഓർ ഡെഫിനിഷൻസ് ഓഫ് modern uh, modernism in art and post modernism so it was deliberately more conceptual so that a certain basic conceptual understanding of what things are is necessary i thought as an introduction uh rather than actually describing in a kind of a chronological way i chose to kind of uh, present before you some specific issues specific uh, questions that uh, entail definitions of these categories called uh, modern art and uh postmodern art as i said yesterday that uh, some scholars do not make that differentiation as uh, two different periods or two different experiences but uh, largely these are seen as two uh distinguished uh, distinguishable periods in any case both these periods are uh have named themselves by the people who live it this is very important like renaissance it was called renaissance by renaissance people right so uh, it was it it's in in the same spirit modern period is ca- called modern period by modern people so also we in our times what we also call as contemporary times we have come to recognize that we belong to a period we can call as postmodern and i have also described to you basically the the qualities or the or the, or the experiences uh, values that uh, these terminologies uh, entail or you as basic uh, information that i have shared with you but today's presentation is uh, about more specifically about pop art but again pop art is not i'm not uh, going to talk about pop art in a kind of a descriptive way that is to say to talk about the chronology various artists important artists non important so it's not in that kind of very uh, you know descriptive manner of discussing pop art but there is of course a um, uh, definition of what pop art is and some examples of pop art would be shared with you but more important than that we would be to identify what pop art signifies as far as postmodern spirit is concerned so how is pop art fitting in or how is pop art making a break away from modernist premises is the one of the themes but if you see that uh, the uh, i am actually concerned about representation primarily representation in in a in a in a conventional sense always meant at least in the western sense western context definitely that representation of something out there reality there so what was in art called as naturalism etc etc at least from 16th century down right so one of the touching stone of the success of the artist or the art movement or art that was presented at least till the beginning of 19th century was realism or naturalism so representation had been a very central point of reference as far as western art is concerned and even when the modernists 
rejected representation, we always refer it back to representation and say that these uh, artists have moved away from representation. It was more like actually seeing it in terms of binaries. Representation, non-representation. Right? So, but we are going to come to a kind of a new mode of representation, new way of looking at representation as far as postmodern art is concerned. So that is why it is called representation of the uncanny reality. Okay? Uncanny would mean actually something that is very disturbing, something that is not acceptable, something not so uh, naturalistic, something that is pleasing. It's not like that. So it is something disturbing, something like a nightmare, something like a kind of a uh, dream. So uncanny reality is the kind of a truth. So it is neither realism or non-realism or abstraction, uh, but it's actually another kind of realism that is this, with this, this, this mode of representation came to be theorized or called as simulacrum or simulacra whichever you may. So I have actually mo modified the title a little bit uh, for today because after reading my notes, I thought that it is necessary to bring in this aspect of realism, this aspect of reality, uncanny reality in representation. Now we'll also see the prehistory of that. Where does it come from? How does it originate? You know, what are the kind of stages that go goes through? Now, as we have also mentioned yesterday, that uh, critical perspective of uh, postmodern uh, art uh, comes out of a challenge that was thrown against the notion of uh, purity and autonomy that was uh, put forward by a theoretician, namely Greenberg, right? Clement Greenberg of America. He was the one who theorized modernism as a movement of autonomy and purism, that is non-referentiality other than itself. Art object by itself. There's nothing outside uh, itself. So autonomy and purity was its final goal. And he defined it in terms of uh, uh, abstraction, particularly in terms of hard edge abstraction or minimalism, right? So, so it is that, that point we had pointed out yesterday. Now, just before uh, 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 Greenberg had actually happened, action painting, particularly by the Jackson Pollock, the artist, American artist, of by uh, action painting was a very well promoted by state, USA, you know, the USA had actually, that was the first ever art movement from USA. Otherwise, it was always French-oriented or Italian or German, so yeah, largely European. So first time, actually, uh, uh, USA came into play a very major role in the art scene, and it is uh, Jackson Pollock's uh, action painting. Uh, if you, any one of you do not know about this, please refer to the internet or book and uh, find out what it is. It's important to know Action Painting and Jackson Pollock as a very significant movement because it brings in the aspect of abstraction along with surrealism. surrealism because he tries to kind of uh, bring out the subconscious mind into play in doing uh, a kind of very unconditional uh, act of making painting abstract painting. So he throws the paint and you know does all kinds of things on the canvas, very primary 
level of art history that is. So it was uh, by 19, it is said that, historians have said that by 1962, action painting of Jackson Pollock was rejected along with much that was notorious in art world till then because action painting was abreast and latest. And after that actually happens the uh, Now, it's very important uh, that, uh, yeah, action painting uh, uh, was the last, but when pop art comes uh, into the scene, it comes out with a, with a kind of a big bang uh, on the scene. And it was uh, considered to be a major break. It was not still recognized that it was uh, a sign of, uh, sign of uh, postmodernism, but uh, pop art actually brought in the, the, the everyday life into painting. That is to say that entire modern art had been, uh, if you look at it retrospectively, it looks like it was very elitist. That is to say, it had a certain avoidance of the popular visual culture. Entire modernism disprivileged the mass art or propaganda art or anything that had actually great to, to do with people in, in, in their day-to-day uh, -day life. So modern art was somewhat bohemian, bohemian in the sense that very revolutionary uh, from the point of view of an alternative lifestyle. Uh, from the point of view of transgressiveness, they were kind of uh, very avant-garde in the sense, but they were not at the same time approachable or reachable to the common people because of its very esoteric nature. There was nothing that people could relate easily. So it was actually a field that became a very secluded field, you can say, of specialists. Otherwise, Pre-modern art was communal, communal in the nature that everybody shared its iconography, everybody shared its, uh, uh, you know, purpose, like if it was church or temple or wherever paintings were done, the narratives were understood by everybody, uh, or the form was very identifiable uh, by common man. But whereas the modern art was far removed from people's own expectation of what art should be. It was challenging that commonsensical uh, sense of art. You know, it was kind of alienating itself. It was making a, an outsider's position about artists. Although it was liberational in a personal sense of uh, 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 liberation, uh, it was largely um, uh, ex exclusive and it was not egalitarian, it was not democratic. It actually was more specialized and more mm, into an elite sphere. It was creating an elite sphere. It was away, much away, away from the low or uh, what I called yesterday as the kitsch or mass art or mechanically reproduced art for consumption, people's consumption. So there was a very sharp distinction between high and low art as far as modernism is concerned. But pop art is the movement that subverts that, that corrects that, that, that changes that, uh, that equation. And the interest of number of artists in the pop uh, art movement uh, used mass media, advertising, uh, comics, things like comics, I'll show you some examples, and other com consumer products. And this is also, this is, a, this is a work by Roy Lichtenstein, and uh, you can see that the plomb with which the image is uh, projected towards you, in a, like in a comic strip, you know, uh, pop. It's kind of claiming that, uh, that, that appropriating that. Um, so, uh, so uh, uh, in general, if you see, 
that uh, 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 pop art actually placed popular and commercial objects on par with fine art. So it's a very revolutionary movement. You may not be able to imagine the kind of uh, uh, the, the kind of revolution that they were trying to make. That until previously, these kind of uh, images were not uh, even imaginable. They were considered as no art or uh, cheap taste and uh, you know valueless art of uh, 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 kitsch. So, uh, so it's first time actually you have some gestures in that direction uh, of uh, uh, some aspect of the pop art of using some kind of popular. Uh, imagery was used by synthetic cubism. That is the second phase of cubism, especially by Picasso and Braque. When they were collaging and cutting and pasting the newspaper, this is actually a, 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 an early symptom of, uh, you know, coming off the real into, into, into painting. How self-conscious that was in terms of a Pope spirit is a question, but as a gesture, already it is there. Like we'll see, ready-mates are already there in, in, in the second decade of 20th century. So it also reflected the increasing consumerism in, in a way uh, a pop art represents American culture. It reflects unmediated in an unmediated way a mindless celebration of the kind of uh, uh, mass culture. So America was actually a kind of capitalist uh, nation, especially in the context of the Cold War between uh, uh, communist and the capitalist world. America was in the forefront of that 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 assertion. So open market and uh, you know kind of freedom of choice and supermarket and you know all kinds of consumer products that satisfies us. Now I'm not going into the dynamics of that particular uh, uh, consumerism that is promoted by capitalists, uh, but definitely this is considered more than anywhere else. Uh, it is reflected in American art of the time in the, in the form of... Um... Now, this also coincides with other larger, other uh, phenomena that came up uh, in America of a descent that, of course, happened with the hippie movement is one thing. Beatles, etc. has happened at that time. But pop music is a phenomenon as far as uh, America is concerned. Also, you have things like in dance at that time, you have also the uh, coming up of the blacks in a, in a major way. So through the 50s and 60s, you see that uh, large scale uh, social movements, you know, uh, uh, which, is, which is somewhat interesting because it also touches upon the fashion. It kind of pushes the boundaries of what is fashion, right? Hip hop, for instance, you know how it kind of uh, celebrates the the kind of uh, 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 the, the 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 public, you know, the the, the mass uh, culture in a in a in a in a very um, interesting way. Interesting way, I would say, more than anywhere else in the world, it was in America that these movements has, have happened. So I'm also trying to say, what I'm also trying to say is that poor path movement is not an isolated thing, but it is actually a large, much larger social uh, movement. Political, yes, you can say political movement also. But all these were appropriated, consumed by capitalist system is a very important critique that we need to kind of look at at a later stage, not right away. So keep that in mind that uh, state promoted it. This is very interesting. All these new developments in uh, America were sponsored by the, the state or promoted by the state. So then even including the kind of uh, 
mercenary, you know, uh, Vietnam War, etc., were also kind of covered up by this, covered up by this, leveled out by this kind of uh, celebrative popular uh, culture. So you can say that uh, pop art was very brash in a, in a kind of a sense of uh, being very youthful. It was fun loving. It was, um, it was originally definitely was anti-establishment. So it had that avant-garde uh, aspect about it. it was challenging the establishment in, to that extent. But it didn't take much long time for establishment to absorb it into its fold. So uh, now certain other points to be kept in mind is that until 1960s, art was thought primarily in terms of two categories, that is painting and sculpture. Of course, under painting will also come printmaking or graphics or things like that. But uh, sculptures, largely, you could do many things in sculpture. Modernists did many things, like one of the ma major adv adv advances was the junk sculpture, welding the junk and creating something out of the junk, especially post-Second World War in America. You know, uh, many sculptors, like many sculptors actually took to that form of expression. So that was the late, that was the, that the brink, that was the maximum that sculpture could come to, you know. So beyond that, uh, art was now splintering. Art was kind of uh, uh, moving ahead. Uh, already you find that modernists in the modern uh, movements like Cubist, Futurist, Dadaist particularly, uh, already challenged this binary of painting and sculpture through inventing collages as well as performativity, like in the case of Tada performances uh, in the First World War time in Switzerland particularly. So uh, already the elements are there, but you see the first uh, uh, ever image, that is identified image of uh, uh, pop art, which calls itself as pop uh, art, is by Richard Hamilton. It, uh, interestingly, it begins in, in Britain. The movement actually has its first manifestation uh, in the works of Richard Hamilton. Uh, the title is also very long and interesting. Just what is it that makes today's home so different, so appealing? That's a 1956 collage by uh, Richard Hamilton. So the word pop was first coined in 1954 by the British art critic Lawrence Alloway. Uh, to, this was to describe a new type of art that was, uh, uh, that was inspired by the imagery of popular culture. Uh, Alloway alongside the artists Richard Hamilton and Eduardo Pauzoli, uh, sorry, Paolozzi, uh, was among the founding members of the independent group, uh, a collective of artists, architects, and writers who explored radical approaches to contemporary visual culture during their meetings in the Institute of Contemporary Art in London between 1952 and 55. So this is actually a post-art movement collective, you can see. Yesterday I pointed out that of in the postmodernist times, you have no more actually the movements in terms of isms, in the terms of styles, but you have more art collectives uh, which are actually coming together for discussing more uh, uh, contemporary issues. And uh, uh, it is not actually trying to propagate one particular style. So, this uh, contemporary art, uh, so the Institute of Contemporary Art and encouraged youngsters to discuss and it was in this that they became the forerunners of uh, the American pop art movement. Okay, so it is Richard Hamilton uh, who is, um, now this particular painting, just what, it, what is it that makes today's home so 
different, so appealing, is that is the ultimate catalog. If you look at the painting, you see that it is it includes so many things. Like you just have a glance of things, like uh, bodybuilding to TV to uh, 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 comics, newspapers, advertising, uh, cars, food, packaging, appliances, celebrity, uh, sex the space age television and the movie so it's a kind of an ultimate catalog of uh, the pop uh, uh, culture that is in vogue at that time in the post second world war time in uh, uh, so it is actually this particular aspect that comes to uh, this uh, of course uh, the, the the british pop has another trajectory which we are, I'm not going into but you should look at uh, artists such as uh, Eduardo Paolozzi you should see David Hockney for sure and also an artist such as uh, Richard Nitz Smith or R.B. Kitai one among them but they are not typically in that definitional sense pop artists but they are more about new figuration so that's actually becomes another category, although the tracing, the origin of them can be traced back to pop instinct or pop, pop uh, uh, inspiration, but they go more into social narrative and politically edged, more serious painting they come up with, more serious, uh, unquote, quote unquote, painting, like R.B. Kitai, for instance, you know, so, uh, or uh, David Hockney, each one of them actually achieved a kind of their own. Francis Bacon, for instance, also achieved uh, that level of uh, expression in um, art. Now, you have artists in American pop art like Roy Lichtenstein, Andy Warhol, Charles Oldenburg, Wesselman. Andy Warhol is one of the most uh, star artists of uh, this movement. All of them actually, one thing that connects all of them is the, another word that is very useful is banality. They drew from banality, from urban America. Banal would mean very crass or very... Nitya Sadharanam. Nitya Sadharanam. Jugupsa, there is some boy. Other than the laugh, banality, you know, it's very banal. The, 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 it's, it means it is not a very sophisticated, elite you know, sensibility, right? So, whereas Valada Sadharna might learn to Samana, Pasha, Enalu, Adinaturu, Musha, okay. So uh, it's sometimes very tough to find exact translation in Malayalam. So anyway, so I'm actually trying to kind of interpret that word for you so that you follow the, what, we, what, is, what is being presented here. So uh, now it is very important to take note of the fact that unlike the emotional aspect of expressionism, even surrealism, even something like Fauvism or Post-Impressionism, modern art in general had been very humanistic, like in, there was a question yesterday. It was human-centered. It was about human expression, the ultimate value of human expression, individual and individual expression. So there's a kind of aura again around this individual expression. You know, the artist as a subject and as an as agent has something to say, something to speak. In Subramanyam's words, you know, painter is supposed to kind of speak, or a quack, he, that's the word he uses, like an like a animal from inside the painting. I'm here, I'm here, you look at me, I'm saying this. You know, this is a kind of very funny uh, caricature that creates about the expressionist. He's a, he has a critique about expressionists from an Indian point of view. That's another story that we'll come to 
later. But what I'm trying to say is that the emotional chargedness of, uh, say, a Sadkin sculpture or a Picasso's, you know, except for his uh, analytical cubism, but entire body of work or Matis or take Kokoshka or uh, any other artist, all of them are kind of kind of bringing, trying to bring out the suffering and the kind of passion and the kind of pain and uh, sometimes also a um, lot of romance and beauty and, and love also. So in any case, these are all human-based expression in, and um, the, 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 the uh, maximum of that you actually get to see in abstract expressionism, particularly in, uh, say, artists whom I have mentioned slightly earlier. And also uh, an artist like, uh, always slip out of my mind, the abstractionist the, uh, of abstract expressionism, the Rothko. You know, it's nothing, nothing in that painting, but still the writers have written volumes on its uh, expressive quality, you know. It's that kind of pulsating quality about his work, you know. Uh, so. So, I mean, what I'm actually trying to say is that um, uh, abstraction in the most abstract sense of the word, uh, most minimal sense of the word, also gave rise to a possibility for human expression. Is, uh, uh, is that what, that is what is challenged by the Pope artist. Pope artists move away from that form of abstraction and that kind of uh, uh, expressionism, and they appropriate it through a certain technique of appropriation of techniques of ma mass visual culture. Yesterday there was a question about uh, appropriation. So I'm explaining it a little more here. So the, the techniques of mass visual culture is appropriated, especially say by an artist like Lichtenstein, selected cartoon strips from regular cartoon uh, books uh, uh, and the, he reproduced it on the canvas. So it was a direct appropriation. Nobody said that he's copying, but he actually projected it on large canvas. The book form printed, now transferred into a painting, you know, hand painted. Uh, so this is what we have actually call large, this, this large scale transformation of a printed material into a large scale painting in oil on canvas. Oil on canvas, which is actually a very traditional oratic medium coming from Renaissance period. And it is here that you see the irony, you know, of uh, uh, method and the image, you know, uh, kind of contradicts. So it was called as simulation, it is called, considered as simulation where a very dry and unemotional fact, narration, fact of narration is represented. And there is no interpretation of the comic strip that is represented. There is, artist is not projecting his subjectivity into it. Expressionism is, can be interpreted as the projection of the artist's subject into the object that he or she is representing, right? So it is actually your own emotion that you're projecting on the object and then kind of bringing it back onto the painting, right? Here there is a complete withdrawal of that uh, emotional projection. Uh, and so there is no interpretation of the of the uh, thing that is represented, that is this uh, cartoon strip. Artists try to make the painting as in a most mechanical way. I mean, this is very, very new as well as 60s is concerned. So it becomes then why lack of emotion in painting? Where is emotion? Where, why there are no emotions, you know? So that is where an irony could be created. So idea that art can be, so there is a, you know, Brechtian sense of alienation working here. Uh, that in the Brechtian sense, in theater, Brechtian uh, notion of alienation is that 
uh, the actor who, who is rep representing something will come out of it and say that I am representing this and this. It won't create that illusion. It won't create that empathy and identification from the audience. Immediately it will, uh, you know, break that continuity and create that sense that, no, you are looking at art. You are not, that is not life. So that sense of uh, detachment, irony that is created uh, so off from the uh, emotionally expressive image to a kind of uh, 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 an image of uh, without. And so it is in this context that we need to kind of think about art as a found object, pop art, entire pop art as found objects, as based on found objects, the idea of assemblage. You know, that already has its origin in the modern times, that is within the second decade of 20th century, or third decade, you can see. It, become, it comes to a kind of a more uh, greater interpretation in the 60s and 70s with the pop artist. That I will explain it uh, as we go ahead. So uh, Robert Rosenberg, Jasper Johns, Jean um, uh, Tingule, Charles Oldenburg, they're all referred also as Neo Dada. They are not referred to as Dada, but they are called as Neo Dada because of the subjects and materials derived from everyday world. So the image that they appropriate is almost like ready-made. What the uh, Marshal Dusam uh, found the Locate that they kept the found object of a urinal onto the pedestal that was considered as the found object, right? And it was considered as Dwada movement, anti art movement. Now, the very same idea of uh, found object is extended to finding images, scavenging in images. So, uh, the materials and methods and images that are scavenged, that is appropriated from the everyday world, marks the, uh, the value of uh, pop art. This neo Dada is not, uh, is the term referred less to Dada and Marshall Duchamp's invention of ready-mades. Uh, he, they, they are, of, of, of course, taking clue from the other movement of found objects, but like the objects that the other movement, like Duchamp has used, like bicycle wheel uh, or uh, the commode that he used in 1917, etc., etc., becomes a kind of a reference point. Uh, so this, as I, as I said, has a lot to do with the uh, 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 1960s art of the pop artists. Like this is Jasper John's painting called Flag. This American flag, as you can see. Now, so this is assemblage. This is found object, etc., etc. Is clear here, right? Now, but there are two important key ideas that they are bringing in when they are doing this. Is that Although it is represented and accepted as art, you know, it doesn't actually kind of uh, uh, totally go away from its identity as a day, everyday object. So that is one aspect. Then, whole, uh, then the argument is that if you can paint an American flag like that, then a whole lot of things can actually be, materials and techniques could also be made into art. That is also the argument. So these two key arguments are very important. So it is actually the, the importance of pop art is also because it is somewhere in between ordinary object and high art, you know. So it's actually kind of frames these objects, this painted flag becomes a kind of a, a, of a, of a reference to this co common object as well as it becomes art. So it is kind of a contradictory in its uh, in its uh, in its presence, 
and becomes important flag. So a, a flag which is a commonplace object and symbol also becomes a formal arrangement to see in terms of its form and color and shape, etc. You know, so that also, uh, so, so, pen, so it, here it is not actually presenting the flag as such, but then further remove it from that object flag into a painting, painted reality. So painting is not substanti substantial as object of flag in any sense, you know, a flag is actually a three-dimensional object, but a painting is two-dimensional, it is painted here. But the tension between the real and the, what we call as simulacra uh, of the flag is uh, very, you know, it creates a tension, it creates a kind of a, you know, uh, aporia, if you want to say, uh, if you want a kind of a vagueness of that relationship uh, between these two. So, also Jasper John's other works, uh, where he where, where he he is supposed to have incorporated, he was also considered to be an existentialist because he was isolating human um, mouth or facial organs, etc., etc., and um, casting them separately. So it also had a kind of a existential, philosophical kind of impact. But when he actually was within the kind of pop art uh, no, notions, he uses uh, found objects like a bulb or a, uh, or a uh, very many objects like a spectacle, like in this case, for which he uses a medieval um, media like ancient uh, encaustic. It's a very elaborate, uh, process of uh, hot wax painting involves using heated bee wax to which colored pigments are added you know so it's a very elaborate process through which that he creates this object but a very ordinary object like a spectacle there's nothing very unusual about it so it's that creating that irony and this use of um, plaster relief in his paintings this use of plaster relief in his painting combines uh, these with the more ancient material as well as the sculptural qualities he used to compose his work. This, 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 that's how he composed his work and that resulted in a kind of very playful manner, very playful uh, and ironic manner. He brought out a kind of uh, status of art. I mean, if you want, it's addressing the status of art. It's challenging the kind of very sacrosanct value of uh, expressionistic art, you know. So he's, uh, so this is uh, uh, titled also very important, Critic Sees, that is what uh, uh, is the title, right? So you find a vague connection between the seeing and the spectacle, but you may also think that is actually cut a critic is actually to interpret the work, will see the kind of complexity in the kind of uh, making of this work. So it is not pop art in that sense of very simple, available reading for, for reading, but it goes through, pop art actually has a much layered approach to, you know, in, in, in uh, creating meaning. So these simple objects are projected as uh, beautiful objects that uh, uh, Jasper Johns creates. Uh, uh, so this is what actually interests the uh, viewer, uh, viewer's attention. And Jasper Johns himself, uh, I quote here, uh, there may, no, may or may not be an idea in these works. There may or there may not be an idea in this work. And the meaning may just be that the painting exists. That it may even simply be that uh, the, the, the work of art is telling you that painting exists as a, as a, a form of expression. So, um, uh, 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 so there is a, that kind of uh, uh, approach. Even a little more complex is uh, Robert Rauschenberg's uh, colliding or collaging, uh, collaging as it comes from post-cubist uh, or late cubist works of synthetic cubism. But here the images are more identifiable, that there is this American 
President John F. Kennedy there. And why is he calling it Buffalo 2? These are also images he has scavenged and silk screened images, painted also. So it's a kind of, uh, uh, so this is a kind of com combining various, or it calls it combines of 1950s. So, the, so uh, he says that uh, these create a certain gap between these objects. You don't know why these objects are together. There is a repetition of gesture that is perhaps also referring to Michelangelo's uh, Madonna of the Rocks, the kind of finger there. Uh, also this finger that is also some pointing to something, right? So the meaning is not so very uh, clear. So this is what he actually then says about his work. Wanted something other than what I could make myself and I wanted to use the surprise and the collectiveness and the generosity of finding surprises in colliding. And if it wasn't a surprise at first, by the time I got through with it, it was. That is, that means to say it's a completely half a sad, it's completely unprogrammed, unplanned uh, uh, collage, colliding. Various things together, they are sometimes not related at all in any sense. So a third meaning is supposed to come through that. That is actually in the process of reading. So the object itself was changed by its context and therefore it becomes a new thing. So that is the kind of idea of uh, colliding that. Uh, now, <clears throat> it is also very important that there are two different ways of using ordinary in the 60s and 70s by pop artists on one hand and minimalists on the other, you know, conceptualists on the other. So uh, we will talk more about the concept art tomorrow uh, in, the next in the next session. So the interest in ordinary, as we have seen till now, gives rise to a new sense of, uh, uh, sense of visuality. And it actually creates two directions. One is pop and other is minimalism. There's nothing common between between, although the technique they are using is the very same. Appropriation, found object. In, in the case of Liechtenstein, he is using a motif from already existing uh, you know, uh, comic uh, page, uh, uh, whereas Karl Andre is putting together uh, already existing found object like bricks, right? So both are actually kind of uh, found objects, but both having two different purposes. So this is also a very significant, important uh, turn of uh, event as it uh, happens. Uh, now this is a work by Lichtenstein who developed his pop style which was based on visual vernacular of mass communication, the comic strip. I mean, this is a very good example of that. And uh, the, the, what is below is actually an image from the comic strip. So it's, 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 it's kind of very melodramatic representation are quoted here. So that is how postmodernism worked. So the hard, here there is another way of using hard edge. I, we, we have meant hard edge painting, right? Very plain color painting. So they, that's one use of it. But here the hard edge commercial style, you know, very plain, simple uh, uh, juxtaposition of colors, as you see in this, like, by the way, it is painted, hand painted, imitating the uh, comic strip. So the hard edge uh, style of Liechtenstein, um, he was very deliberate in creating an antidote to the incoherent splashes of late um, abstract expressions. So the kind of abstract expressionism that we have talked about, the kind of expressionistic outpouring of uh, you know gestural abstraction, uh, is now completely replaced by a very mechanical, uh, almost. Uh, 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 using expression, an already ex existing expression, 
in the comic as a quotation into a painting so now it is also very important to take note of the fact that unlike dada unlike dada movement which was uh, arguing for an end of art or anti art right we talk we we have known in the second decade or third decade the coming up of dadaism was arguing for an end of art and a beginning of conceptual art right so it was challenging its own system its own its own practices so pop art has no intention of protest in that sense it is not actually saying that we are actually challenging art we are not cancelling out the possibilities of art in fact pop art is the new breath that comes into like art world art that was almost at, at the dead end of the minimal abstraction because i said that minimal abstraction was an argument that was an end from there you couldn't actually go anywhere but uh, 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 coming back into the pop that was rejected that was subaltern that was something that was minor you know uh, bringing that aspect into uh, creating art so it was not actually so much protest in that sense as we understood in the case of dadaism uh, challenging establishment and uh, uh, revolutionizing uh, art but here it was more assertive of a new way of making new way of survival it's a way of american survival in in the mechanical you know commercialized uh, uh, kind of creative so i have a quote from here uh, here i don't think that pope and this is the quote i don't think that pope would have existed without dada so they acknowledge the Uh, indebtedness to dada having existed before dada exist having existed before it but i don't really think that pope is dada so you may see similarities one is inspired by the other but the purpose is totally different i don't think that i look on my work as being anti art or anything that is different from the mainstream of painting since renaissance so there is a reinvention of painting with pop art there is a reinvestment in 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 painting as a medium of communication as a medium of expression so that is what so anti art so there is also another take of uh, critique of dada uh, ism we will find in joseph boys very interestingly in the next lecture so please keep in mind very key movement that is uh, dadaism and particularly marshal lucham nobody rejects marshal lucham everybody has a or about him but if people artists have actually deviated from him has branched off from him from him i would say my grandfather was great but i don't want to be like my grandfather you know it's something like that you know so i am actually of the new age and i will be a new 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 person so uh, there is that spirit of progress there is that reinvention of uh, human spirit that comes in 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 it through actually a language that was so mechanical actually i used to hate pop art to be very frank <laughs> i used to think that it's very anti human <laughs> i mean as a student i would say I would, i'm confessing so that is also because that is the impression that it do it represents america you know it's capitalist you know kind of thing uh a feeling that that but then you you study it you understand it you understand that it is a kind of a reinvention you know i'm not really uh legitimizing them totally but you see that historical role that they play as a very crucial they play a very crucial role at a crucial time you know uh of uh, art coming to a dead end and then reviving itself uh it, to become uh, something so uh lichtenstein further says that my work sanitizes emotion 
but it is also symbolic of commercial art sanitizing human feelings. Now, you see, commercial arts like um, macho men performing things, you know, uh, it kind of, you, you are awe-inspiring, you know, kind of performances of Mohan Lal or Salman Khan in the popular uh, mind or popular representations. So, here he sanitizes that emotional, you know, litty and kind of by stepping back from that, you know, and kind of quoting them, he creates that uh, sense of, I think it can be read, uh, he kind of sanitizes, you know, I can quote anything in this classroom without having to uh, face any, um, you know, kind of uh, rap from any authority, any conventional, you know, this thing. So, quoting is actually a kind of, if I kind of say, put it in between two inverted commas uh, in, in writing, but in art, it, it, it is kind of directly quoting something. You can always kind of quote something because you don't take the responsibility of that, right? You are saying that somebody else is saying it. So, I am actually going to say something more about it. I'm not that I'm going to subscribe to it. So, quoting, quoting as a kind of a method of uh, uh, postmodern appropriation, like uh, Andy Warhol is the primary example of that. He uses even the knitting kit, knitting kit the women uses. Uh, sorry, the gender uh, comes there. But whoever kind of knits on the basis of the given patterns. The companies actually provide you the how to kind of knit, you know. And then you create a beautiful landscape or a beautiful flower or whatever. So, so he paints it. Do it yourself. That's the title of 1962. Do it yourself. Flowers in bracket. And it is actually through the process of repetition. Or in other words, it is appropriation on one hand, but it's also parodying. Another terminology that comes very handy as far as postmodernism is concerned. Yeah, of course, Andy Warhol is much uh, talked about. You, ha you have a celebrity status. He is an iconic uh, presence as far as pop culture is concerned. Like Much like, say, an equal, maybe Ma Jack Ma Michael Jackson, you know, in our own times. Uh, so he painted Marlon Mandro and the tomato soup uh, Campbell uh, painted all that. So I would like to kind of go through the notes that I have here. Warhol was against the idea of skill and craftsmanship as a way of expressing the artist's personality. That is a kind of a post-Renaissance or all through the history of world that you have art expresses himself or herself through craftsmanship, uh, skill and craftsmanship, right? He claimed to have removed both craftsmanship and personality from his own art. Like uh, Lichtenstein, who has used uh, the, you know, uh, this thing, and kind of make it impersonal. So uh, he, he keeps that personality away from his own art. So that also gives him a kind of a kind of a play, a, a possibility for playing, uh, performing multiple roles. So it is often said that Andy Warhol is not just one person. There are several Andy, Andy Warhols, depending on the situations, that he would assume various, uh, you know, mantles or various uh, 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 roles. So uh, there is a quote here. The reason I'm painting this way is that I want to be a machine. So, for the first time, I, I think somebody in the world has said that I want to be like a machine, although it might have been experience of many, you know, that treat, to be treated like a machine, treated like, to be treated like an object, like a slave, you know, driven by a master. Machines are, after all, kind of driven by it's uh, you know manager, who manages. 
So the reason I'm painting this way is that I want to be a machine and I feel that whatever I do and do machine-like is what I want to do. If you want to know all about Andy, Andy Warhol, just look at the surface of my painting and films and me. There, is, there I am. There is nothing behind it. This is where the last part is very important. There is nothing behind it. In the sense that whatever is in the painting is on the surface. That no need for anybody to kind of poke your nose inside and try to find out the inner meaning and the interior meaning and blah blah. Which is actually the kind of, uh, the kind of uh, practice that had been in art interpretation as well as also in art making. There's an aura that artist carries, an artist has something to say, and artist kind of buries it in the painting or a work of art, then the viewer is supposed to kind of somehow or the other kind of make sense of it. You know, you go out with a candle and find out, you know, how, what artist's mind is uh, when artist has worked. So, <coughs> so the critic's job is actually to kind of put an end to that doubt, whether it is meaning this or that. You know, it is, that is to be the role of the critic, right? To put an end to the doubt as what the artist is meaning, right? But Andy Warhol is saying that you don't do that with my paintings. Uh, whatever is you have to understand is on the surface. That is, whether it's color, whether it is uh, image, whatever, it's sensation that it creates. So he compels you to look at these images that he draws. That is also the reason that he repeats them, like a mantra, you know, in the Indian context. Yeah, that you repeat that same, uh, you know, uh, image several times so that to make you conscious of it, you know. It kind of drills into you, it grows into you. So, uh, the, so, so the, he, he, of course it's, uh, so, so it is very interesting that so, uh, it is Andy Warhol who personifies that spirit of uh, pop in a most figurative sense, you know, in a kind of a very uh, literal sense um, that he, 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 he lived like that also in his personal life. Uh, <clears throat> Warhol's painting of Mar Marlin, Marlin Monroe, he was also kind of sexually uh, kind of uh, entering into the personality of Merlin Monroe in, in a way, you know, kind of, he had also a very difficult sexual identity, especially at that time, you know. Uh, so that point is also kind of take, to be taken, like uh, Bacon, Francis Bacon, he was also a closeted gay. And uh, uh, so a fashion, no, it's like our uh, Jackson Pollock, Right? Uh, sorry, Michael Jackson, who would never come out and say that he is so and so sexually, but he, there was a lot of play that, that was in his body. You know, that was a lot of, he himself was kind of a uh, configuration of play. So these are some of the summing ups that uh, Charles Oldenburg was the greatest sculptor, as I <coughs> pointed out earlier. Uh, creating large-scale public sculpture, you cannot really um, mm, uh, uh, complete the discussion on uh, Pope Art without Oldenburg, some of these works. Of course, he is parodying this um, Kiss by Brancusi of uh, early 20th century. Uh, through duplicating this uh, pin that, uh, you know, cloth clip uh, titled as uh, cloth pin sculpture, but it's actually kind of <coughs> parodying. So he, he constantly uh, sculptors, sculptures, uh, sculpts large scale works in public uh, places, lipstick. Uh, so ironically, it is actually anti-war, uh, it's an anti-war monument uh, there, where performances, etc. Uh, take place. There is also a corn ice cream there. There is also cherry there. 
So um, he is uh, represented. I, I'm not going into greater details of these representations because we have already talked about the conceptual basis of uh, pop art. Now comes the next important uh, 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 task of mine uh, in presenting before you the idea of uh, simulacrum. That is the issue of representation. Oh, for me, thank you very much. Ah, I can continue, no problem. Serve the tea. Shall I continue or shall I wait? Continue, okay. So I'm actually going to talk about the question of representation in the context of uh, postmodernism and the most important concept that has come about in talking about it is simulacrum. Uh, so we start from the very, very beginning of art history, namely Plato. <laughs> Right? You cannot escape uh, Plato and Aristotle. Um, so, uh, to talk about uh, uh, the origins of visual art and its under our understanding of visual art, you know, theoreticians like Plato. Um, <coughs> uh, visual art uh, uh, was a matter of real and the copy. Visual art, ours, the main concern of visual art, according to Plato, was about real, outside, out there, around us, and how you actually copy it into your work. So that is why the famous dictum that art as a mirror held against nature. It, you must have all heard this particular formulation. Are they bored? I'm just referring to it. <laughs> it things doesn't stop there. <laughs> but in any case, this is a crucial concept that structured, especially European art. That is simply put, realism. The challenge towards realism. That was the kind of earning of the all periods since Greek art, from archaic Baroque, sorry, archaic classical to Baroque phases. You know the evolution that happens from early Renaissance, High Renaissance to Mannerism to Baroque, Neoclassicism. Everything actually kind of goes around in the line of representation in terms of real. You know, real there, out there, and how you get it in the uh, in 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 art. So this actually had been a crucial concept of uh, visual art from the time of uh, Plato, and art has to be. I think Malayalam has a very good word for it. Yata tatham. At Sanskrit, no, comes from Sanskrit. So as it is, so it is in the art. No. As it is there, so it is there in the, in the art. Now, this was also a complex. Now, since everybody is having tea, I can take a little diversion and, <laughs> and say that uh, this was not the criteria for Indian art, by the way. There is nowhere actually you find something like what, what Plato has said, that mirror held against nature. Right? So, here probably the system was somewhat different. There was an idealized, imagined, there was a greater play of imagination. There was no need for realism to be present, that we could accept players or the performers doing other things also, you know? 
like a Kathakali dancer also, may be sitting and smoking a BD, perhaps, you know. You, it is not much of an anomaly for us to, to see that, right? So there was no ultimate sense of illusion as far as art is concerned, as far as India is concerned. But it is with that criteria that the Europeans started looking at Indian art of it lacks illusion, it lacks realism, it lacks proportion. So if you start looking at things from the point of view of the lack, then you will miss actually what actually it is. So that's what happened actually. So then theoreticians had to kind of, like Kumar Swami and others, had to kind of come in, come in and say that that is not the principles of Indian art, that is not the criteria of Indian art. So, uh, whereas European art largely, uh, from Greek tradition onwards. Now, it is in this context that the Latin word simulacrum means that it is actually the word phantasm in, in, in English, if you say. Phantasmagoric, there is a usage like that, no? There is, that is, phantom actually comes from that. The phantom, this, uh, <laughs> the, the, the cartoon figure, the, like the mandrake figure. It is false or untrue. So simulacrum actually as a word means false or untrue. And this is what was the problem of Plato. Plato, uh, Plato uh, banishment of painters from his republic since truth is the idea. He finally gave uh, pre predominance or preeminence to idea and he distrusted, distrusted the imitators of, uh, after all, you know, artists cannot give life to. Uh, so, uh, so this duality of uh, real and the unreal uh, informed art history. <clears throat> now you will also find the titles by Vasari, for instance, Life of the Lives of Artists. He's a Renaissance art historian who calls conquest of the real. You know, when the real conquests uh, the, the visual presentation in the lives of artists. Or even in our times, in the modern times, in E.H. Gombrich, art and illusion. You know, how art creates that illusion of the reality is this question, you know. Uh, uh, many modernized books are actually written from the perspective of birth and rebirth of pictorial space, for instance, you see. Uh, how uh, Greco-Roman people knew illusionism and how in the medieval times it was lost and then how it was revised, revived. So what is the greatness of Renaissance? It reinvents uh, that illusionism. So real is something very, very valuable as far as European art is concerned. Uh, <clears throat> and on the other hand, um, the understanding is that modern art as rejecting illusionistic resemblance, like I mentioned earlier, it's true. It, retain, it kind of uh, devalues representation in that realistic sense. That was one major problem also. Now, if there is a problem in art appreciation today in Kerala, it is because it doesn't look like Ravi Verma. No? Devi Verma is the kind of uh, ideal artist for the common uh, imagination. So that, that, that is because he has the mastery of real illusion in his art, right? So uh, <clears throat> modern art as such, uh, uh, rejecting illusionistic resemblance, rejects model and copy, that notion, original and reproduction, uh, that notion, image of likeness is also kind of cancelled out in modern art because it's, it's a kind of a creation of abstraction of the real. But the binary still exists there. <coughs> so that's why the term mimetic art, sometimes visual art is called mimetic art, anything that imitates. Mime is an imitation, right? And affirmation of the real where 
simulacrum was denigrated as its negation. Wherever there is simulacrum or phantasmagoric representation or phantasm, it was a negation of this reality, understood as a distorted copy of the reality. Now, there is this question as in European art that is constantly asked, when you have not seen the demon or when you have not seen the angel, how can you represent this? So all those representations, according to Kurbe, our realists, he said, I will not paint uh, angels because I have not seen them. That's ultimate, absolute fidelity to the, to the out, world out there. Right? So, whereas all the fantastical demonic creatures are considered to be unreal and uh, non-existent and, and it was not, it was just tolerated. There was no authenticity about it. Whereas the mimetic image was considered primary, although it was a secondary thing compared to the real that was outside. So, once removed from the real is the real art. That is very important also that uh, uh, um, our own uh, Akbar, the great Mughal king, in his uh, Ayn Akbari, he is supposed to have quoting, is quoting. He says that the great artist, you know, knows that he can't limit, imitate God. That is what makes him humble. In the sense that there is creation outside in the world which he cannot give life. In, as a painter, he can only represent. So it's somewhat removed from the reality outside. You know? So it is in that sense, uh, uh, simulacrum as an image without model. As a, uh, uh, it's, a, it's a falsity that an artist is... Uh, because there was no sense of imagination. There was no understanding of... Uh, 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 so, uh, so simulacrum, when it was used in the Western context, it was uh, in the med medieval discourse, it was a negative uh, value, it was of a negative, negative value, De deemed, it was considered as um, false or as untrue. It was an aspect of classicism, of Eurocentrism is also involved. So already I pointed out to you the Eurocentric aspect about it, when it, in the colonial uh, invasions happen. They project this need for the the, the, the illusionistic art, you know, as a as a you know the kind of great achievement. Now, since so the simulacrum as a terminology was underground and under after Renaissance, and it was actually more. Um, favored word was lifelike. Even if you painted something which you have not seen in a lifelike way, like a demon in a lifelike way, an angel in a lifelike way, uh, it was acceptable for the Renaissance. So that negativity of the medieval period and the ancient uh, Greeks was avoided in the, in the post-Renaissance time. Since 1960s, so this is more or less actually the framework or the paradigm in which modernism was understood that realism, non-realism, narration, non-narration, uh, representational, non-representational, right? Uh, fabulation and everything and pure, right? Nothing uh, autonomous and referential. Autonomous is something, something self-contained, referring to itself, and the other is actually that references to everything in the world, right? So these kind of binaries are kind of challenged since 1960s. So since 1960s, the question of real is raised, the quote-unquote real is raised. The solidity of real is questioned, especially with the rise of popular visual culture like cinema. How real is cinema? How real is photography? Is a question comes, no? Uh, photography is actually kind of pretends to be real. Or cinema pretends to be real, but it's not real. Right? Or TV printing, etc., etc. 
So uh, new technologies and commit concomitant uh, transformation in the notions of art uh, representation, artist, critic, theoretician, philosopher return to the repressed term. It is in the 60s, 1960s that you go back to the medieval concept of uh, simulacrum as a useful thing to talk about. And it is a theoretician like Giles uh, Deleuze in 1965, uh, sorry, in 1967, in the essay, The Simulacrum and the Ancient Philosophy. It's actually, he's actually talking about the concept of simulacrum and it's, uh, he attempts to reverse platonism. He interprets, reinterprets the notion of, uh, uh, he uses uh, simulacrum to make it a crucial critical term to define postmodernist uh, times, especially postmodernist representation. Uh, <clears throat> he replaces the priority of model and copy with an inverted system in which simulacrum doesn't claim the status of being a copy of anything. Now, if you have been always used to say that art is a copy of the real or art as a copy of something that could be convincingly real, you convince as real. The Lou says that you don't need to have that paradigm, that framework, right? It, uh, uh, you don't have to work with the idea of copy and imitation. So the Lou says that the copy, the quote is this, the copy is an image endowed with resemblance. Simulacrum is an image without resemblance. It is a reality in itself, by itself, for itself. So it's a third reality, a real, a representation of the real, and a reality created by itself, for itself, by itself. It's another reality, a parallel reality, if you want to say. So modernity is defined by the power of simulacrum, he says, and the loose uh, discusses Andy Warhol and Francis Bacon, and Foucault takes on surrealism and uh, René Malgrici to discuss the same, to discuss the question of representation, and to, to discuss the question of what is represented, and what is its fidelity with the uh, with the out there world, you know the the real world. So Sibilacrum gave an opportunity for Deleuze to invert subvert, you know, to alter the platonic hierarchy of real and the copy of the real. You know, this hierarchy and provided a new model for artistic production that didn't privilege the unique, the ideal and the numinous, you know. Uh, it still was within the realms of aesthetic so what he actually wrote about, about uh, the alternative uh, uh, realism in art, the simulacral, real, uh, simulacral representation is by itself real. Uh, followed by Baudrillard in his 1981 infamous writing, very notorious writing, Simulacre et Simulation, the French writer placed the issue in social debate. So very interesting forward, you know, push to the idea of simulacrum happened with Baudrillard based on the politics, political currents rather than the philosophical. See, till now uh, in Deleuze we see more philosophical interpretation of, uh, or even in Foucault we see more philosophical interpretation of simulacrum as an autonomous uh, uh, thing. Uh, but here you find a, a, an aspect of the mm, political interpretation of uh, 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 simulacrum. The postmodernist French social theorist Baudrillard, for instance, uh, argues that a simulacrum is not a copy of the real, but becomes truth in its own right, the hyper real. So he is actually the one who brings in the issue, the, the concept of not real, but hyper-real. He names it as a third uh, mode of representation as hyper-real. <clears throat> so it is not surreal, it's not uh, uh, dreamlike real, 
You know, it's not based on the real. It's no, it's hyper real. As such, uh, Baudrillard sees four uh, different kinds of uh, realisms. He says basic reflection of reality, that art cannot be imitative of reality, it can reflect reality. It can pervert the reality in the sense that it can distort reality. That is the second category. Third is pretense of reality, that is, it can dress up like reality, so to say, you know. Uh, where there is no model. You know, something can be presented as it is happening, it's in the real sense. Uh, uh, fourth is simulacrum, which bears no relation to any reality whatsoever. There's no referentiality to it outside itself. It's a reality by itself. So he gives examples of uh, <coughs> things like uh, Disneyland, and uh, uh, other examples I have also, but uh, I quote here Baudrillard, it is no longer a question of imitation, nor even of parody. It is rather a question of substituting signs of the real for real itself. It's, it's another set of signification, uh, signs. Illusion is no longer possible because the real is no longer possible. That is uh, Baudrillardian uh, interpretation of uh, it. He 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 is uh, not concerned. Examples of giving not giving examples of art or philosophy, but strange spaces of postmodernity like Disneyland, and also quote uh, presents Nietzsche's imagination um, in of Utopia. Simulacra is uh, perceived as a negative. It's not a kind of uh, uh, anything that is uh, to be tested with anything real, anything that is outside. So Baudrillard's concept like Nietzsche's uh, is simulacra are perceived as negative, but Deleuze takes a different view that is seeing simulacra as a venue by which an accepted ideal or privileged position could be challenged or overturned. This is also to say that uh, uh, Baudrillard's position is to challenge the established notion or commonsensical notion of real, you know, authentic versions of the real, whenever it is uh, presented. So it can overturn the simulacral uh, uh, argument, if you like to say so, uh, can uh, 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 Deleuze defines simulacra, uh, quote, those systems in which different relates to different by means of difference itself. Now, this is a little uh, complex for anyone to understand, but you keep it for thinking further. Those systems in which different relates to different by means of difference itself. What is essential is that we find in these systems no prior identity, no internal resemblance, but an absolutely new reality. So we can say in conclusion that the, the postmodern uh, realism that you find to get to see in uh, pop art is something that replaces reality with its representation. That is to say, it moves away completely from the modernist notion or the pre-modern Renaissance notion. It is uh, something that, uh, so the value of uh, these perspectives are very important. So Baudrillard in his uh, uh, precision, of simulacra defines this term as follows. Simulation is no longer that of a territory, a referential being, or a substance. It is the generation by models of a real without origin of reality. It, that is why he calls it a hyper-real. It is no longer a question of imitation. So art is no more an imitation. It's no more, actually, we don't have to talk about Plato's mirror held against nature. 
So it is not uh, an attempt in duplication, nor even parody. It is a question of substituting the sign of the real for the real. So it's a complete uh, uh, reversal of the uh, uh, argument. Logic is very uh, radical. His uh, preliminary, primary examples uh, are psychosomatic illness. Is that real or not? It, is, it exists by itself that the kind of somasat, psychosomatic illnesses that you dream about, for instance, or the hallucinations that you may have, or the Disneyland, or the water great uh, arctic, architectural complex in Washington. It's filled with everything. I mean, anywhere you have uh, this. Uh, so, <clears throat> so, Frederick Jameson follows these definitions uh, of simulacras. He says that peculiar function lies in what Sartre would have called as derealization. Another word that was used by Sartre uh, in the existential context is. Uh, derealization of the whole surrounding world of everyday reality, complete transformation of that reality. You know, if you read Kafka, for instance, you know, transformation of the, of the human being into an insect. You, know? uh, you can actually try to read it from the point of view of uh, surrealism. It's a play of surrealism, surreal play. But it's not a surrealistic novel. But it's actually trying to create another reality, a simulacral reality, a hyper-real, you know? It's a kind of hyper-real, it's very psychedelic real uh, <clears throat> that you find in uh, Sartre's uh, theorization. Art has transformed into pseudo-events, so art doesn't need to be fiddle, art needs to do justice to the what is outside in terms of reality outside. But these are um, uh, spectacles, so today's art you can see that uh, more than real, you know, Spectac spectacular, creating spectacle for its own sake. And uh, art is often delusion and not art and delusion. Art and illusion, art and as illusion, art as creating illusion of reality was the criteria of Renaissance and post-Renaissance, but art today as creating delusion. This somewhat relates with what I mentioned yesterday as art of failure. You know, it, it is, it's failure. And then actually then you, you can probably think of its, uh, its, uh, its uh, you know, reality from a different perspective. So this is, this is the uncanniness of simulacra. This is the uncanniness of the mm, new art. It is neither anti-art, as in the sense that we negate art, no art, anti-art, we jump into the sea and die. It is creating art, still feeling that you are not doing something that great something, you know? That it is something that is to be, you know, flowing in the drain tomorrow. I mean, that is to use a metaphor of having to fail, having to get destroyed, right? So the uncanniness of that reality, that truth, is something that is very, very um, real. That is what I was showing you yesterday in the ending in the ending part of my presentation yesterday. I showed that installation, which was a machine, which was kind of you know designed in a particular way, but it expressed more than the artist intended to express. You know, so often actually it happens that expression of an, of an artist maybe he or she may be thinking that it's forever creating it forever, it works in a particular way, etc., etc. No. So that uncanniness of the, uh, on the slippery grounds of today, you know, 
that uh, art is. So that is what I have to present um, for today. Uh, I hope it made uh, sense to all of you. <coughs> we can take some questions like yesterday. Hello, Masha. Uh, art <laughs> practice <laughs> similar base See, the thing is that all these are theoretical formulations. Uh, you can interpret uh, something in art through this, these concepts. That's why what, it has two benefits. One is that you try to understand that philosophers have uh, put in a third possibility of thinking, you know. Uh, possibility of thinking in the sense you don't have to work in 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 the uh, uh, original and you know representation modern representation in the in the sense of um, illusion model right that theoreticians provide a kind of a, their attempt is also in trying to explain the contemporary reality in terms of how do you explain what you see the fantastic, the you know the the kind of fabulated, uh, spectacular, uh, visual practices of today, right? Uh, especially kind of uh, applicable also to uh, pop art in that sense, right? <clears throat> now it's not that you have to apply it. Not necessary that you have to apply it on everything and see. There are still artists who are sitting and doing the model study in your own college, right? In everywhere. That is actually the kind of practice of our training. So there are still the Plato's ideas of real and the unreal works, right? Now if somebody is doing a self-portrait, which I noticed in yesterday's studios, a lot of people are actually doing self-portraits, which I think is a very positive thing. To, to, to make yourself a subject of what you are trying to show. But then how do you go beyond yourself is the question. I mean, what you belong where, you know? What is your context? What is outside yourself? How do you identify yourself with a larger, much larger reality out there? What you can identify or what you can question, what you need to question. So always an auto or self-referentiality, do not stop there. It gets, you know, translated onto, connected, that's the right word, uh, uh, translated onto the social reality or political reality around you, right? So your question is some coming from somewhat of misunderstanding of this theory, I'm not actually talking about the primacy of the theory or theoretical concepts. Some of the theoreticians help us in understand art. Yeah, so my approach to, I don't study theory for its own sake because I don't want to be a philosopher in any case. <laughs> I like the uh, philosophy in relation to art. That's my career, my practice. Right? So, so much as uh, philosophy has something to do with art, I would be interested. Right? And I would read Foucault or uh, Judith Butler as far as it helps me to understand what is gender, what is rule, social, anything. No? Uh, what is activism, what is anything. You know, I will read theoreticians for making sense of the world, you know, that surrounds you. That when you are seeing a person with no gender or gender confusion, how do you interpret that? How do you understand that? How do you... So wh why am I like this? If somebody asks me, I'm not a psychiatrist to counsel him. But as an art historian, what I can tell him. As a human being, what can I tell him? 
so only theoreticians can broaden my knowledge no after all theories are explaining things in in brief what is happening around you you get my point so theory has no existence by itself no applicable no uh, applicable theories no it is a the it is a fate of the theory that it has to perish it has to die it has to be replaced this is also true you know so there is no ultimate something about theory but theories are tools which you can use for interpreting life or art you get my point if judith butler has not told me that it is fatal to think like man or woman i would have never understood why i feel like a woman sometimes no sometimes at least oh why in my childhood i cross dressed to make sense of that i must know it so theoretical knowledge helps us to understand ourselves and the world so simulacra is a very good concept to understand uh, something like representation in pop art because it's a very unusual mode of representation right you accept that right i mean at least for the 60s and 70s it was unusual i mean it was very very different from what we have seen in modern art throughout modern art so it makes it gives you simulacra i brought in simulacra because it makes us uh, possible to interpret it in a particular way now is that applicable to everything is not because everything is not uh, possible everything is not possible how can you interpret say abstract expressionism from um, simulacra or picasso from simulacra because picasso is saying that i am representing the world picasso is very clear that he is his experience is based on the bombing of uh, this particular town right uh, gurnika is a result of that a response of that right so he is trying to kind of capture that emotions and expressions it's based on something right you know i don't know whether i made it clear have i made it clear whether is maybe you can think further and we can ask you can discuss it further yes sir i have a question how has uh, pop art come to uh, a sensible play in india and if so uh, can we see the ca calendar culture introduced by ravi varma as um, i mean uh, as a pop art uh, if not literal band ravi varma definitely was not a pop artist yeah but like not simply because he didn't have the consciousness of the pop artist and uh, so that question is not there but uh, he definitely was a limitator of the western art right of the illusionistic art naturalistic art so he is a product of uh, of of uh, british uh, uh, colonial rule right and colonial education and a kind of a, he imbibes a kind of a, 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 a mental structure that is derived from the west so he's a highly westernized uh, you know perspective there's a corrective method also of that now as far as pope influence is concerned i would want to argue i don't know i'm not very sure about it that pop art is the only is the movement that is international in our times because it showed its manifestation everywhere in the world because that rebellion towards a puritanical modernism was a necessity and in india, in india you have somebody like say baroda school one thing uh may not be everybody there but surely bupan kakkar but you have also artists like uh, 
Bikash Paracharya and others in the 60s and 70s. To a certain extent, probably also, not may not be around to that, but maybe some other artists also. But it's also about a certain consciousness, no? It's not about academic arts being practiced at that time in the 60s. It's about in, in, take, quoting from the Pope thing, right? A popular. So, but see, I will come to the Indian. I don't want to preempt all that, what we will discuss in the third or fourth uh, or fifth uh, session. I will be definitely talking about the um, Indian pop in the case of Bhupen Kakkar and how he reconciles with the hybrid Indianness. You know? He is the artist who points out the fact that a hybridity is Indian. You don't go into Tantric and Vedic and Mantric and this and that, you know, which are bygone and non-existent. But talk about what is today, what you see in the life around. Uh, so where do you actually see the mixing and mingling of uh, very many strands of culture and ethnicity, where you can talk about, I mean, can we talk about uh, India in Indianness without uh, English? Maybe we are talking Indian English, but uh, English is a foreign language, we know it's a colonialist language, but then we use it to speak against them. So, uh, a language by itself is not, uh, makes us uh, colonized, but language can be used. So, uh, uh, the Indian hybridity, Hybridity is a quality in, in pop art, you know. So those who argue for pure, pure, pure uh, forms, you know, or purity in anything, you know, suffers in the face of that. So it's, uh, it's a very blasphemous, very uh, mm, mm, something that is uh, 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 like Hussein, for instance. You know. Hussein had took that freedom to represent so-called Hindu gods and goddesses. But that's your cultural background. You have seen, uh, like anybody else, Ramayana being performed in Ramlila. There is no restriction to a Muslim, right? So you have seen Hanuman sitting and pumping the um, Petromax, right? So, there is a certain liberty that you can take with your own gods or godly um, heroes, right? So, a certain popular is there in Hussein also, in that sense, that way. that's what I'm saying. It not, may not be necessarily in a conscious manner, but Indian in that sense, you know? Uh, uh, so, these are questions that would come face us when we discuss uh, modern day art, Tuesday and Wednesday, yeah? Okay, actually, uh, Wednesday we have the full day. Kavita has uh, kept two sessions there. Okay. So that's when we discuss Indian art, right? So hope we will address that further. Hmm? Any other questions that we would like to discuss? Hmm? Yep, uh, sir, my not sure. Actually, this is about a particular juncture in uh, art history, about this abstract expressionism. Uh, since you talked about uh, Pollock, uh, I've been following uh, some of his early works, uh, I mean, for the last few years. And uh, finally, I found a collector. He was posting uh, some of the early works uh, he has collected from Pollock. And that is just like a very amateur kind of, you know, uh, you can imagine at the age of 24, he has done such a very um, kind of work, but uh, he makes sense in, uh, in the trajectory of action painting that way. So, uh, what is, uh, how is it connected with this sociopolitical condition? Uh, can you throw light on that uh, a little bit? Uh, I think that's a much larger question that what you are asking. That's not 
necessarily that we need to restrict ourselves to Pollock. Pollock is a modern artist, definitely, so he is like any other modern artist. Like, see, our perception of modern art, it is all about positionality. If you are talking from the point of view of the Russian communist point of view, uh, modern art was debased. It represents the degeneration of the capitalist society. Right? So it took uh, some time. So, uh, so there is nothing revolutionary that one could see there until it was kind of recognized, avant-garde was identified that this kind of liberation from the um, Victorian uh, values of neoclassical Victorian values or the feudal values through the 19th century and 20th century, the liberational aspect of modernism. Although they are not directly uh, linked to socio-political revolution in that sense, you know. Do you think artists should be directly linked to sloganeering? No, I don't think so. So they practice what they practice. That is what uh, is happening, has happened. Uh, like Cezanne was very much focused on his uh, rigor in wanting to represent something, you know, very authentic. You know, you can see that, you know, that passion. Or Van Gogh. Where was he political? He was a suffering human being, definitely wanting some appreciation. He tried to do many things and kind of killed himself at the end, right? So it's actually the political is then you, you see it from outside or see it from a certain framework. So it is the, from that framework that you see modernism as a liberational politics and as a uh, freedom in expression, human liberation in terms of uh, expressive possibilities, exploring possibilities. But if you think in a more conventional sense of political, then it will be like the statues of Lenin and you know, uh, those kind of things. Do you consider that political? That is political, definitely within the kind of uh, confines set by that communist regime. Whereas, look at the murals of uh, Mexican artists. They participated in the nation building. They made public murals. They, uh, you know, kind of... Uh, so, especially today when feminists say that personal is political, there is to be strong distinction between personal and what is personal and what is political, right? Then, but until the feminists came and said, no, what we are feeling is because we are politically subject to oppression. So the interpretation of political itself has transformed. Is something that we need to understand. It is actually from the perspective that you find, you know, what is political. Now, I'm not very clear about, I'm not able to remember the works of Jackson Pollock, early Jackson Pollock. Definitely, I don't remember my, in seeing in my class, in art history classes, like Parimu's classes, etc. But, uh, so every artist goes through that struggle, no? Then they come to come some kind of uh, resolution. Then they uh, get a certain historical insight into uh, what they must do. Their mission comes into their uh, perspective. And then he kind of does it, you know. So Jackson Pollock's early works, I don't know whether it has any indication of his, uh, this thing, but definitely historically he combines expressionism and the surrealism. This is very important because uh, it is a very conscious attempt in um, bringing out the subconscious anxiety and you know, pain and whatever is in the, you know, through an action, through a gesture, onto the canvas. So, uh, so to that extent, it is. Uh, but of course, you have also simultaneously other uh, sculptors like Gaikomiti, you know.
who is also a kind of a, begins in a surrealist kind of mode uh, of uh, image making. Uh, some of his works can be counted, early works can be counted among the surrealist sculptors, but uh, his works are very much existentialist, you know, in the, in the later works that he has done, those, uh, you know, uh, Second World War time and the post-Second World War time, where he shrunk, he kind of creates human beings who are shrunk and the kind of very nervous kind of surfaces that he creates, you know, it's very disturbing. So the language that has that quality of expression, you know, that is different from Kiefer's, um, you know, expressionism, definitely. So expressionism is also not a blank sense, a certain personal sensibility also comes in. So, yeah, well, art history gives us historical uh, value, no? historical information and historical possibility. They are very, very um, iconic artists, you know, Mondrian, Malevich, to, you know, um, any of them, Jackson Pollock. So, they are in history because they do have some kind of uh, significance in terms of historical history. So their historical significance is not directly in terms of political, in terms of a propagandistic politics or a uh, sloganeering politics or not, not also in terms of uh, state politics, like totalitarian government politics. No? So their politics is actually something much more uh, about humanity. It's about human predicament. Art, after all, artists are the most sensitive part of the human society. I would consider it that if society is considered as a big organism of some sort, you know, artists would be the the, the most sensitive people. No. Uh, sensitive uh, uh, organ in that organism that would express itself, no? So the anxiety that you find in um, Jackson Pollock uh, is definitely a political, according to me. Even uh, the, the, the withdrawal of human figure and going into a kind of a, like for in Nasreen Mahmoudi or Mondrian or, you know, is also a kind of withdrawal of uh, of a uh, unbearability of world, you know, a world that is uh, so cruel in the context of the First World War, and also human tragedies of all kind, you know. So they go into a kind of an existential uh, existentialism. As such, is a political movement, isn't it? So although it doesn't have slogans, so. You have to see art, modern art, particularly in a larger political, uh, larger uh, framework. That that that's my um, impression about it. Uh, but I'm not actually uh, saying that artists who are sloganeering are less important. Artists who work within the communes of uh, political communes are less important. I will never say. Uh, like for instance, Somnath Kaur or Chitta Prasad, you know, in our own context. They chose to work in the context of communist. They wanted to see an application of their art within the social, political context, you know. So they function as reporting, reportage. Instead of photography, they drew and sent it out to the world to know what is poverty, what is suffering, what is, you know, famine. So that was more an applied art, art in the context of crisis. And so that is also very valuable to us. No? So but perhaps it is because of this spirit of modernism that somebody like Somnath or, I mean, that's my way of understanding. Despite the fact that he withdrew from that, he never left that sense of hurt and wound feeling 
for the wound. Uh, so, where is the politics in his wound, if you ask? You know? I mean, in the sense, uh, how do you say it? You, know? you can only say it in the larger context of it. You know? He had all the right to walk into modernism, to do abstraction as he liked. Going with the times, he joined as a graphic artist. He was in the institution. So also Jitta Prasad, they all moved on in life, you know, in some ways, and up, you know, believed in something that was useful to them. So, um, yeah. So I mean, I think I've made it uh, clear that. Uh, uh, the, the politics of modern uh, uh, art is not spelt out in that sense of, um, you know, very clear terms, but you have to see, read it in the context. But surely another kind of politics, like the Dalit politics, would come and say that these are all upper caste uh, fantasies, you know, upper caste, uh, uh, what do you call elite things, you know. Uh, so there is a possibility of a critique of that claim of revolution also. Or a feminist can definitely say, definitely like Chuck's, this uh, Griselda Pollock, if you read Griselda Pollock writing, then you will see a critique of modernism. How masculine oriented the whole history writing had been, how sidelining the women had been from in uh, impressionist time onwards. You know, how women's labor had been always under, you know, uh, used and appropriated in the domestic context or in the studio context as assistants, etc. Et so, mm, so then you celebrate artists like, uh, like Fida Kahlo or uh, Amrita Shegal or, you know, like that, you know, or Padmini for that matter. Uh, so, so it is from a politics that you reclaim some of these artists from the history, right? So politics works in very, very different ways, you know? So it depends on the times or beliefs that you, you hold on to. Or uh, say, so, so this, this aspect can be extended to LGBTQ people also, you know? LGBTQ also wants to write a history of their own, you know? Now, where do you search for the history, you know? So they do have a history in, in art and literature. So that is politics, you know? So, um, yeah, something what you must have looked at or something you must have read without understanding that politics or without knowing that politics. Now you kind of see it in a politics, you know, political sense, you know? My own presentation about Bhupan Kakha, you will find that uh, reflected. Because no scholars who ever wrote about Bhupan Kaka never mentioned about LGBTQ movement. Surprisingly, they only talked about art, his great contribution to art. That is because he was useful in the market. I mean, to be very blank, blank, uh, no, sorry, direct, blank. Uh, yeah, if I say it very frankly. So uh, that aspect, how to kind of put him back into a kind of a political framework would be a kind of question. So despite all that, especially talking about um, Jackson Pollock uh, or Kiefer, maybe there is a critique. In fact, there is a critique about expressionism itself as a self-projection, you know, too much of a self subjective projection onto the subject, you know. Uh, so that overbearing importance to the self that you find in, in uh, expressionism is somewhat, that is also the reason that many artists like Rims and Italian trans avant-garde uh, to uh, uh, our own, uh, uh, this, um, what's his name, Surendra Nair, etc moved away from a kind of an expressionist, to random school expressionism, to a more classical kind of, you know, more detached. So also in the case of Sudhir Patwadhana, very conscious decision to do away with that subjective projection.
because they have their conscious choices. So Jackson Pollock may stand criticized by feminists, especially the macho ness that is involved in that kind of outpouring. Hmm? It's almost like an attack. It's almost violent. So there are two sides to it. So I don't um, subscribe to one of them. I understand both of these. I mean, there are certain things you can't settle uh, and decide finally. Uh, that was a nice question that helped me to uh, articulate a larger... Uh, that, uh, that aspect I had not touched in the presentation uh, because I didn't want to bring that in, you know, into the discussion. Not because I'm not prepared for that, but purpose was something else. So, anyway, thank you very much. Sir, a small uh, brief question, uh, last question. <laughs> Let it be, no problem. Uh, uh, I mean, now, uh, can you just elaborate on any uh, critical takes, important critical takes on this argument about simulacra? Like, the whole spectacular uh, world that we are in. Uh, where is artist subjectivity here? Because uh, when truth is not available, not possible, then where is, uh, where can you place the artist uh, in a, artist subjectivity, what is it? That kind of a position you can't, because all the time I have seen the critique of spectacular, uh, spectacles. Uh, so, I just want to know what are the critical positions against the arguments of Simulacra and all? No, Simulacra is basically um, arguing that there is a right for a third representational possibility. That's all they do, they're doing. They are not getting into the rights or wrong of it. Right? That's the possibility. You don't have to think in terms of dualism, of uh, realism and model and the copy of the model, you know, that that dualism you don't have to kind of uh, 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 consider, but you just consider a third point, third possibility that it's a by itself complete, and it's a real. Now, that is by, that is acceptable, I think. Uh, what is actually, you are extending it to another issue, that is the spectacle making of the contemporary art. No, no, it's up to us, it is up to the artist. I mean, I may like it or not like it is my taste. I cannot say that you should not make spectacle, you know. That's one function of visual pleasure. Like, why do you go for a firework? I mean, simple thing that you get that sensation in your eyes and in your brain and you feel good. Right? I call, you call, often ask myself, why do I send a flower picture that I take as a good morning to my friends? Why? That's because a visual can actually trigger a little good feeling in, the, in, in what you're seeing. So similarly, subjectivity is not the primary issue in contemporary art. I mean, for many artists. Since postmodernism rejects it, with pop art rejects it. So also, indigenous like Kumar Swami to uh, K. G. S. Brahmanim rejects it because they argue that in Indian context they argue that impersonality had been the uh, rule of the thumb, you know, in India. That artists never bothered too much about talk about their subjectivity. This weight of the subject, having to speak about your own subject is a modern burden for the Western imposition, like that. So they are impersonal. Like for instance, Nali Nilima Sheikh's painting, for instance, it's more craftsmanly. So also Gulam Sheikh's, isn't it? Where is the subjectivity? And we have to really try very hard to find that subjectivity of a Muslim subject, if you're talking about you know, uh, um, some people have tried from anthropologists an anthropologist like uh, 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 Schitzwitz, that uh, American uh, art historian has 
written about Ghulam Sheikh from a point of view of being a Muslim identity issue uh, in, in a book that uh, has come. Uh, yeah, so everywhere it is not necessary that artists should speak about their subjectivity. But in certain movements, it had been very important. Like, for instance, women artists, feminist artists, not just women artists, uh, LGBTQ artists, Dalits, uh, all these, that's why these are kind of, uh, for them, expressionism and subjectivity are important tools, not necessarily only self-projection. It is not to be just simply seen as self-projection, but it's a necessary self-projection. Much needed, historically much needed self-projection. So, whereas um, uh, 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 Anish Kapoor can create technological, you know, great uh, vistas of vision, like that is actually very contemporary everywhere you go, architecture, you know, it's more like the media and, you know, the kind of thing that you find. So art cannot really lag behind there, or Subodh Gupta for that matter, you know. It's not, it starts from a certain personal discourse of identity and then gets into very quickly into a kind of spectacle, you know. So I don't know how to kind of differentiate these two. And also I refer to Jitish Kalat's uh, father and uh, something about moon and moon years or something like that in the Dogbe uh, Taravada. So there is also a kind of a kind of a mysterious play of something, you know, there. Uh, but it is uh, biographical, surely. It comes from his background, its uh, father, etc. He refers to. But it's not, in that sense, it's expressionistic. It's also contained. It kind of holds back. You know, so but at the same time it inscribes something about the self. So completely that sense of an expressionistic uh, subjectivity is uh, uh, not applicable everywhere. It's very calculated and mediated today, I would say, in various contexts. So it doesn't mean that uh, all women artists or all feminists would use expressionism. That you have uh, definitely a Nasreen Mohammadi. Uh, who, whose struggle had been always to contain within oneself and translate, you know. That is also a modernist premise because you want to be neutral. You want to be gender neutral also. I don't want to be counted as a woman. I'm an artist, they will say. You know. But, of course, Geeta Kapoor has written about her as a woman and as a uh, friend and as a beloved who is all that. So that is an interpreter's job. But my understanding of Nasreen Mamadi is that she believed in a kind of a neutrality in terms of gender. She didn't play around her, you know, uh, womanness or sexuality in that kind of flaunting way. Uh, easily identifiable. I mean, that's my impression I'm talking about. So it is also not necessary that um, the subalterns have to resort to uh, expressionism, but often it is seen as resorting to expressionism because there is a lot of repressed things that needs to come out through a kind of an outpouring, you know, uh, a lot of uh, LGBTQ people who behave in a performative way, you know. In public, they dress up in a different way, or they kind of move around in a particular way, or things like that. That's more performative in, in its. That's auto-suggested. They may not be doing that in their personal uh, spaces, right? So again, the application of gender performativity comes in there. But then you want to be all the more woman, you know. You want to project your all the more womanness. The transgenders would try to do that, right? So it's a little 
complicated an issue. So I, as I said, the answer is not uh, too short. So I hope uh, I've addressed your question, right? Thank you very much.